I'd like to invite Maung Zani again to moderate the uh, opening keynote. Please, that's it. Well, <clears throat> let me introduce somebody who doesn't need uh, any introduction. Um, may I invite um, Professor Yang Hee Lee uh, to take the um, podium to deliver her uh, opening keynote? Please welcome uh, Professor Yang Hee Lee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great honor to be here in, in my own uh, background, my front yard, as a matter of fact. Um, and it's wonderful to see such a turnout. And I understand there are participants from so many different countries, which I think is very encouraging that, um, that we show solidarity and join hands in trying to not only address the issue, but trying to find a solution to what's going on uh, recently. I would like to thank the organizers for hosting this very important conference today as we approach the two, year, two years of genocide committed in Myanmar against the Rohingya. What is important it for us is to um, talk about how rape was, has been and continues to be used as weapons during wars and genocide, past and present in this region. Okay? The two people that I would really like to um, recognize are my dear brother Zaini, who is Yes, I agree, foul-mouthed, uh, but very effective foul-mouther. And he seems like he has a little magic hat where he pulls out things all over the world at, at very opportune times. And how he organizes these, these conferences worldwide is just beyond me. I cannot do what he's doing. And Kinam, who's more soft, spoken, who I fortuitously ran into in Dhaka Airport a few years ago, has been such a great um, advocate, and he's, he has joined hands with other civil society organizations in Korea, and, and is just um, really bringing the issue of the Rohingya uh, into the public eye of Korea and trying to make the connection with what's happened there as into what's happened here in Korea historically. We were under Japanese occupation for 36 very long years, very long years. Um, so I'm going to start today with um, speaking about, I want to say, share something about what Zaina Zaina Bangura, the former special representative on sexual violence and conflict, had once said, I quote her, she said, sexual violence and conflict needs to be treated as the war crime that it is. It can no longer be treated as an unfortunate collateral damage of war. That is such a strong message. Okay. And how often have we treated sexual violence as just an unfortunate collateral of war that happened in the past? Yeah. We must remember that during World War II, all sides of the conflict were accused of mass rapes. However, neither of the two courts set by allied countries to prosecute um, suspected war crimes in Nuremberg and in Tokyo recognize the crime of sexual violence. This is definitely a big reason why the crime of 
comfort women, for lack of better word, I think, sexual slavery, left a terrible legacy, which has lasted until today in our country and in our neighboring countries. I've seen some colleagues from um, Taipei who's come, uh, and uh, I'm very happy that you're here. It was only after the ICTY, the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslav in 1993, included rape as a crime against humanity. The court later expanded the definition of slavery as a crime against humanity to include sexual slavery. Then the ICTR, the International Tribu Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in 1994, also declared rape as, to be a war crime and a crime against humanity. In 2002, the ICC, the, the International Criminal Court, included rape, sla sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, and any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity as crime against humanity when committed in a widespread or systematic manner. The court later issued warrants, including several courts, counts of rape as both a war crime and a crime against humanity. In Myanmar, the military, the Tamadon, has continued to enjoy, employ this horrific tactic of sexual violence in Kachin, Shan, Cayenne, and now in Rakhine State for decades with total impunity. Just yesterday, the, the FFM, the fact-finding mission, just launched a second mini thematic report on sexual violence during conflict. And I have said repeatedly that the modus of operandi of Tamadol during uh, conflict in other ethnic areas has been the same as what we've seen recently in, uh, in um, Rakhine State. They used rape against women, girls, they used uh, mass killings, and just a few years ago, a mass grave was discovered in Northern Shan. They not only used um, forced sexual violence against boys and women, uh, boys and, uh, and, and men. And I have, sp and I have spoken, and I, when I visited uh, prisons in Kachin State, in Bamol, I, I met with young men who were accused under the terrorist uh, law as harboring or having affiliation with terrorist organizations. And how they break into these people was the Tatmadaw will of course give, will torture you and deprive you of sleep. They make you engage in sexual activity in front of others, in front of the Tatmadaw, the officials. That is, that really breaks people's soul, not only their dignity. And listening to these young men telling me this, it was, it was the most difficult thing for me. And after the 2016 so-called ethnic cleansing, which the Tatmadaw considered as clearance operation, tying of women in the homes or taking women out to the hills, gang raping for days, tying women up, tying men up in houses, locking the doors and burning these houses. Okay raping multiply in front of their kids, um, doing all kinds of horrific acts against women and young girls, even pregnant women, throwing or slashing or cutting heads off of infants, throwing infants into the fire. And I have seen kids who were rescued by their mother with multiple serious burns. And 
when you see a little boy of three years old who came up to me one day in Cox's Bazaar, and he had no expression in his face, and he wanted to tell me that they did this to my father, meaning they chopped him to pieces in front of a three-year-old boy. Can you imagine the trauma that leaves this boy? And the longer they, and we, for me as a child developmentalist, I work with child abuse and trauma and prevention of child abuse and what the abuse, early childhood abuse uh, has, the, the, how it manifests later in that person and how it affects the society. We, we worry about re-victimization. And the longer they stay in these camps, in dire conditions, they've been there for two years now, or some more than two years. Of course, in the 90s, too, some came. Every morning they wake up, they see where they're waking up to. Kinam said, good morning. But it's really uh, not a good situation they're waking up to. That is Every day they are being re-victimized and being reminded of why they're there and what the, that long process was for them for even getting to that place. Okay. The, key, the two key words of this conference are genocide and accountability. And against this backdrop, how does one move forward? First, I would like to speak a little bit about genocide. Then I, will, I would like to speak a little bit about accountability. And finally, I will discuss how to move forward in the context of Myanmar. And that's the title of my keynote, How to Move Forward. Okay. Before addressing the issue of genocide, whether it is genocide or not, as some argue, I will briefly explain the result of relenting efforts of Raphael Lemkin, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, better known as the Genocide Convention, that was adopted on 9 December of 1948. Finally, genocide was codified, was classified as a crime under international law. Since the entry into force of the Genocide Convention in 12 January of 1951, it took about three years to enter into force because you had to have a certain number of countries that would ratify an international treaty or convention for it to enter into force. This convention enjoys about 150 ratifications and 41 signatures. Of note, Myanmar became a party to this convention in 14 March of 1956. As aforementioned, how, how to identify what has happened in Myanmar and what, and, and that which is continuing into the present day has been debated by, by many. I firmly believe that one must call a spade a spade. There is ample support for identifying the current situation in Myanmar as genocide, an ongoing genocide. Allow me to support my position by explaining briefly what the convention uh, states. The convention defines genocide under its Article 2 as one of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups such as killing, maiming, killing members of the group, Second, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Four, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Article three goes on to list the following acts as punishable. There's five acts. First, genocide. Conspiracy to commit genocide. Direct and public incitement to commit 
genocide, attempt to commit genocide, complicity in genocide. Does that all ring a bell to you? Does that say something about what's happened in Myanmar and what's happening in Myanmar currently? I don't have to go into details further. The intent has been demonstrated by the statements made by the high-level government officials and the commander-in-chief of the Temadol Myonglang, General Myonglang. Statements such as, and he said this publicly, and I quote, the Rohingya are unfinished business, clearly points to the intent. The fact-finding mission in Myanmar, for Myanmar in 2018 in its High, in its high um, uh, Human Rights Commission report found four of the five defined acts, killing, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm, inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the group in whole or in part, and four, imposing measures intending to prevent births. Births have been regulated for the Rohingya for many years. No more than two children could be registered under the household lists, blacklisting more than 5,000 children. In 2004, the government introduced a new law, which was included in this uh, religious uh, package law. Uh, that may place birth spacing to 36 months to areas that are declared special zones. And Rakhine is a special zone, according in the eyes of the Tetmadaw. The 1982 citizenship law literally made the majority of the Rohingya, who once were considered citizens, as stateless. There is no freedom of movement by Rohingya living in northern Rakhine, IDP camps in central Rakhine and other areas of the state. Access to education and health care is minimal. More surprising is the continuous denial of humanitarian aid to many parts of the state. The actual number of deaths recorded, in the, recorded is not conclusive, but Médecins Sans Frontières MSF survey estimated at least 6,700 6, Rohingya were killed during the 2017 attacks. Myanmar has not allowed any international investigators into Rakhine since 2017 August clearance operation, including myself. Let us not forget the so-called clearance operation that drove out over 80,000 Rohingya in October 2016 following ARSA attacks of October 9th of that year. I am concerned that the international community is beginning to overlook the situation of over a million Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazaar, which is now truly a human rights crisis. Responsibility for which lies in Myanmar. It is entirely their responsibility to bring about all necessary conditions for all the people they forcibly drove out to return or return, and they are completely failing to do so. The remaining Rohingya in Myanmar continue to be denied their rights and, per and persecuted by authorities, making returns from Bangladesh impossible at this time. 128,000 Muslims, including Rohingya and Kaman, of whom 53% are, are children, st still live in encampments in central Sitwe with no freedom of movement. Even those who participated in that famous 2014 pilot ver citizenship verification process in Mirbon still do not have freedom of movement. The only free quarter, it's a misnomer, I think, on Mengla in Sitwe, it's not free, where about 5,000 Rohingya live also exhibit dire conditions. They have no freedom of movement out to move outside of their so-called free quarter. In Chokpu, the booming area where a special economic zone will be constructed, Thousands of Kaman Muslims, who are one of the 135 recognized ethnic minorities under the 1982 citizenship law, still remain in camps 
since, since 2012. Now, are these conditions conducive for return? Conversations I have had with many refugees reveal the following. They wish to return to Myanmar, but only when they know that they will be safe. They will have citizenship and equal rights with the rest of the population in Myanmar. And they will have their property returned to them. Houses and land that were left by the Rohingya when fleeing to Bangladesh have mostly been burned and bulldozed. Satellite images had shown constructions of roads, military bases, and other government buildings on these land that belonged to the Rohingya. Recent satellite images show no construction, or rather construction of the raised property for the Rohingya to return to, only separate housing away from their original places has been built for the returnees, creating a more long-term apartheid-like segregation. We have to remember that in 2014, a new law was passed, the disaster management law, whereby all land or property that is burned returns back to the Tatmadaw. In November 2017, the two governments of Myanmar and Bangladesh concluded a joint agreement for repatriation that would be safe, voluntary, dignified, and sustainable. One year after the agreement, there was a sudden move for repatriation, creating great panic, and no one volunteered. Some even went into hiding after finding out that their names were on the list to be repatriated. Again, this past August 15, two governments, Myanmar and Bangladesh, announced that 3,450 persons were on a list approved for return between Myanmar and Bangladesh, and the date they said was 22nd of August. UNHCR Myanmar has been banned from visiting uh, Rakhine State by Myanmar government. So they could not verify the actual conditions the Rohingya would be returning to, and they expressed concerns. No one volunteered to return this time too. Yesterday I saw, I was given information about buses waiting for the in the transit area, no one volunteered to return. Unless conditions were safe, and citizenship status will be restored, and that everyone individually were consulted and made true voluntary decision to return. Now, nowadays, it's the second wave of this push for a repatriation, and now the, the refugees in the camps are, for, are now facing another dilemma, another problem is that now they will have to deal with, okay, when will the next push for repatriation be? Now let me address accountability. In my report to the 37th session of the Human Rights Council, I recommended the establishment of an accountability mechanism to maintain and prepare evidence in a master database to support, facilitate impartial, fair, and independent international criminal proceedings in national or international courts or tribunals in accordance with international criminal law standards. Justification for an international accountability mechanism was that Myanmar repeated, demonstrate, repeated demonstrated failure to, uh, to hold those responsible for violations to account. I have, reportedly, I have repeatedly reported to the Human Rights Council that the pattern of gross violations of the human rights of the Rohingya suggests a widespread or systematic against, against systematic attacks against this community, possibly amounting to crimes against humanity and warranting the attention of the International Criminal Court. However, I have, moreover, I have consistently been raising concerns over possible commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Kachin and Shan states, where a protracted conflict has been taking place since 1961. Accountability must be established for the widely reported serious violations of international human rights 
anti-humanitarian law, including extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances, destruction of property, torture and inhuman treatment, rape and other forms of sexual violence, forced labor recruitment of children into armed forces, and indiscriminate or disproportionate attacks in Kachin and Shan. It is clear to me that accountability cannot be achieved in the domestic arena. The military announced in March that it had established an investigative court to respond to allegations made by the UN and non-government organizations. Its function and how it worked how it work in parallel to the Independent Commission of Inquiry are not clear. The Independent Commission of Inquiry was set by Myanmar with the head by, headed by um, Rosario Manola from Philippines, former ambassador, and there's a Japanese a former ambassador in the commission and others. I remain highly con concerned about the commission, which announced in May that its staff had finally undertaken training on international standards for evidence collection and international criminal justice nearly a year after it was established and shortly before it was due to report its report to the president of MEMA. Moreover, the mandate of this commission has now been extended to 2020. This further demonstrates it does not have the capacity to bring justice to victims or be in a credible form of accountability. Of note, there has been a multitude of commissions and military commission established since the 2016 clearance operation. The recent, uh, if the, the very uh, popular case of the two Reuters uh, journalists who was pushing to expose what happened in Indian, the massacre of Indian. They were sentenced for 515 days. They were put in jail. They were finally pardoned by the president, but their charges were not dropped. They still are on their, their charges are very serious charges under the Myanmar uh, law. Whereas this, they found seven soldiers who took part in this Indian massacre. They, of course, jailed them, but they were quietly released after seven months. And we only, the international community, only found out months after that they were released. And I bet the charges were dropped. We don't know. I and the fact-finding mission have found two of Myanmar's most opaque enterprises, Myanmar Economic Holdings Limited, the MEHL, and Myanmar Economic Corporation, MEC, both of which are owned and influenced by senior military leaders. Among them are Commander-in-Chief, uh, Senior General Mi Aung Lai, and Deputy Commander-in-Chief, Vice Senior General Sui Win. Furthermore, the FFM recently exposed the MEHL and MEC owning at least 120 businesses involved in everything from construction to pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, insurance, tourism, and banking. Both companies, along with at least 26 of their subsidiaries, hold licenses for jade and ruby mining in Kachin and Shan states. International human rights and humanitarian law violations, including forced labor and sexual violence, have been perpetrated by the Tatmadaw in northern Myanmar in connection with these business activities. Their report, the FFM's report, detailed how 45 companies and organizations in Myanmar donated over $10 million to the military in the weeks following the beginning of the 2017 clearance operations in Rakhine. So-called crony companies with close links to the Tamadol later financed development projects in Rakhine State that furthered the military's objective of re-engineering the region in a way that erases evidence of Rohingya belonging to Myanmar. Their report named two companies, KBZ Group and Max Myanmar, which helped finance the construction of a barrier fence along the Myanmar-Bangladesh border. Knowing that, it would contribute 
to the suffering and anguish associated with preventing the, dis the displaced Rohingya population from returning to their homes and land. They also found that at least 15 foreign firms have joint ventures with the Tetmadol, while 44 others have some form of commercial ties with Tetmadol businesses. These foreign companies risk contributing to or being linked to violations of international human rights and humanitarian law. I was encouraged to hear that one state, one country, Belgium, has decided to not to, to cut ties, business uh, um, engagements. At a minimum, they're, they're contributing to support the military's financial capacity. I have previously raised concern that Myanmar security forces contribute three personnel to UN peacekeeping. Given the most serious allegations of commission of international crimes made against the Tamadol, I believe that in principle, Myanmar's contribution in the peacekeeping force is highly inappropriate and must end immediately. This recommendation did not catch people's attention. That report was last year to the G8, but it did not catch people's attention. Now, how do we move forward? I have, throughout my mandate, advocated for an end to impunity, redress for past abuse, establishment of the rule of law, and democratic reforms. First and foremost, Myanmar must be referred to the ICC without delay. Establishment of an international tribunal was also suggested by, my, by myself, by me. In addition, application of universal jurisdiction is on the, another means of moving forward, where uh, different countries can apply universal direction, jurisdiction when members of the Tatmadaw or the persons who, are, who are, are known to have committed or contributed or complicit to genocide when they're traveling. Of course, the ICJ is another avenue, and, I, and the OIC um, has now brought this case, initiated a case, the Gambia has initiated a case, uh, um, the I, ICJ. But that seemed to have stalled. It's been about two months, and we don't hear much from ICJ. Um, moreover, I have been urging that together with civil society, the international community consider justice in a broad sense to deal with Myanmar's past, in accordance with the pillars of justice, truth, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence. Accountability necessarily involves criminal, criminal justice. However, non-punitive measures are also important. These include the government recognizing and taking responsibility of what has happened in the past. Saying, yes, we had done this terrible things, and we are going to fix it. That is the first step for any government to, uh, to move forward on accountability. Without taking these steps, denial and avoidance will only continue and serve to encourage ongoing systematic violence, violations. Specifically, I recommend that the international community keep victims at the center of all approaches to justice and accountability and take gender into account. In addition to reparations, urgent and term relief should be provided to victims who interact with the newly established IIIM and other accountability processes in the future, such that they are ensured protection and access to livelihoods, education, health, psychosocial, and trauma care and legal assistance. Victims should also be provided with assistance and support in accessing accountability mechanisms, and their right to remedy must be upheld, including through reparations, compensation, restitution of property, and guarantee of non-repetition. Restoration of citizenship mem to members of the Rohingya community with an assurance that they can enjoy the same rights as the other Myanmar citizens is recommended. 
And seizing arbitrary and discriminatory denial or restriction of citizenship rights and documentation to members of minority religions or ethnic ethnicities are also recommended. Amending or repealing the 1982 citizenship law should also be conducted. Furthermore, revising or repealing all arbitrary and discriminatory regulations, laws, and policies that have been previously identified me, by me should be conducted. The Kofi Annan Commission came up with a recommendation, and I think, um, I'm afraid this is a misnomer, a pathway to citizenship. That's a misnomer. I strongly disagreed with that. It was the one sticky thorn uh, and the, uh, Kofi Annan had to compromise with the government of Myanmar, especially Don Son Suu Kyi. And so they kind of watered it down to say pathway. What if the pathway leads to a detour or a short end? But we have to remember that before 1982 citizenship law, many of the Rohingyas were citizens of Myanmar. So I keep saying, restore their citizenship. And even within the 1982 citizenship law, if it was applied by the letter and the spirit of the law, many of the Rohingyas will still have their citizenship. They would not be considered stateless. For a sustainable peace and peaceful coexistence, all acts and publication of advocacy of national racial or religious hatred that constitute incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence, including on social media, must cease in addition to enacting a law to prohibit such acts in accordance with the Rabat plan of action. I am not advocating for a law on hate speech, no, but I am advocating for a comprehensive and anti-discrimination law and policy and active education and awareness campaign about um, discrimination. Okay. Finally, and I, I, repeat, I include this in all my reports, although you have heard the Rosenthal Report, you have heard of the Rosenthal Report, a comprehensive, transparent, independent review of actions by the United Nations systems must be conducted, ensuring that any final report and recommendations are made public. You will see these exact words in three of my reports to the UN, consecutive reports. It must include actions taken in the lead up to and after the reported attacks of 9 October 2016 and 25 August of 2017 in Rakhine State regarding the implementation of the UN's humanitarian and protection mandates and within the framework of Human Rights Upfront Initiative and an assessment of whether the United Nations and the international community could have prevented or managed the, the situation differently and make recommendations for accountability if appropriate. We have, seen, we have heard so much rhetoric as never again by the UN and the international community. How many never agains are you willing to listen to, hear more? Okay. I regret that the Security Council has proven to be ineffective in maintaining peace and security. Therefore, there should be thorough discussions on how to make the Security Council more effective. There should be complete overhaul or reform of the Security Council. If it is going to uphold the UN Charter, notably Article 1, Paragraph 1, which states, the purpose of the United Nations are, Article 1, to maintain international peace and security, and to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace and the suppression of acts of aggression or other breaches of the peace and to bring about peaceful means, and bring about by peaceful means 
and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement. In sum, all of the aforementioned steps must be accomplished in order to move forward. When you probably heard when, when you saw my um, title, how to move forward. Oh my gosh, is she going to say, let's forget, let bygones be bygones? No. Without achieving these, there really is no way Myanmar and its people can move forward. Welcome, Kotwetswe. Welcome. Good to see you again. That is an enormous guy who led the White Rose Campaign. If you've seen me address the June Human Rights Council, I was right wearing the White Rose Campaign. It was initiated by that young man. Yes. It's okay. I thank you for your attention and wish you a very fruitful conference. And I will, I will be more than glad to receive your questions. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Yes. Um, Twenty minutes. Okay. We have um, twenty minutes of our Q and A. Um, I will take um, three questions at a time. Uh, but I want to kick off this uh, Q and A with my own um, a question to Yang He. Um, uh, as as you well know. The um, genocides are not exclusive properties of the Nazis or the Africans. But, you know, we in Asia have lived through, since the end of World War II, a number of major genocides. You know, the um, uh, genocide of the Chinese uh, in the pretext, under the pretext of uh, anti-communist uh, in, by Indonesia under General Suharto in 1965. Uh, you know, the followed uh, within a decade by Khmer Rouge uh, genocide that wiped out one third of the entire population. That has been called uh, after 40 years of the act uh, genocide. And in in between, we had 1971 West Pakistan genocidal attacks against um, East Pakistan, today called uh, Bangladesh, and now today. Yes, uh, Sri Lanka, um, the, towards the end of the, uh, um, uh, the, the ending of the war. And, and, and uh, at the time, um, the UN Secretary General was Ban Ki-moon. And um, Charles Petrie was commissioned to write um, uh, a assessment of the performance of the United Nations. And UN came categor categorically uh, short of what it was supposed to do. And uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, from this country uh, started this rights upfront approach. And today uh, we are seeing that under a new general secretary, secretary general, um, Guterres, the United Nations, not only the Security Council, sec secretary general himself has shown incapable of acting while having been informed by no one other than the president, Thang Sein, that Myanmar was intended to deport the entire population of Rohingya. That, that is to say that Myanmar president had the gall to tell the, the visiting uh, the high official from the United Nations, at the time um, Guterres was head of the uh, UNHCR, that Myanmar was planning to commit crime against humanity, and Guterres himself failed and did not take uh, personal responsibility. Now he's heading. The same with the Kofi Annan. He failed as the head of peacekeeping mission. He shelved the, uh, uh, the, the telegram from um, the Kigali uh, sent to his office that there was going to be a genocide, and he shelved it because he knew which side of the bread was butter. The Americans said Clinton was not uh, prepared to act. So. Do you, do you think that um, Asian continent today, from Japan all the way to India and anything in between, have been extremely, um, what's the word, 
it's made up of two types of states, bystanding states, such as uh, ASEAN states, with the exception of Malaysia, and sadly, Republic of Korea, taking a bystander position, and active collaborators, Japan, Philippines, China, India, protecting and supporting Myanmar. What is the possibility of acting on the legal and moral obligation under the interstate treaty, G genocide convention? Finally, in 2007, Yugoslavia, uh, not tribunal, the states of Serbia and Montenegro were challenged by Bosnia and Herzegovina at the International Court of Justice. And the ICJ ruled that uh, all the member states, not just the signatories of the Convention of the Genocide, are obligated under international law to act to end impunity and genocide. Do you think a country like South Korea should be morally and intellectually brave enough to mount legal challenge at the ICJ using genocide convention instead of leaving it to an African country like Gambia? That's my first question, and then we'll take uh, three questions. <laughs> See, that's a mouthful, Zarni. <laughs> that's a mouthful and a mindful. A whole. I can speak a whole afternoon on that topic, actually. Well, if you look at, and please, um, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to make a political statement here. This is my home ground. But I must say, I am going to call a spade a spade. That's my, that's my moral motto, as I always call a spade a spade. If you look around what's happening in South Korea and its neighboring countries, uh, this is North Korea and Japan also, and you, um, well, our neighboring country as US and China and the Soviet Union. And how the, the Korean society or the government is responding to some of the major issues. I don't think the, the current government will have the know with all, the capacity or the political will to bring a case forward to the ICJ. I think it's terribly uh, shameful that we're not. Daewoo is not the only one that's going in. POSCO, there's a huge building by POSCO in uh, Rakhine State. And uh, I think in that Rakhine Investment Fair, Korea w was like the fourth country that pledged um, investment. I mean, why are they doing this? They're going to, they're actually contributing to the, con the, uh, the Contribution to genocide, the ongoing genocide. Okay. Yeah. So Korea would not be a country that I, I said it will not have the political will. They would not have the know with all nor the capacity. Okay. Now we're facing WTO issue with uh, with things with trade issues with um, Japan, and uh, we're facing um, what is it uh, defense. Uh, budget with U.S. now, <laughs> and we've had hor horrible experience with Chinese boycott of our uh, trade, of our uh, anything, to, our travel or anything, as a result of uh, the THAAD, the, what do you call it, the thermal high, whatever. These are the um, uh, military uh, planes or equipment look like planes that will uh, regulate and see if there is a uh, missile or a nuclear rep, uh, missile that is being um, released in North Korea that will be co coming towards our direction. So that's not a possibility. Now, however, having said that, um, um, I think a country like Malaysia would be in the best position to refer this case to ICJ because it is in an ASEAN. ASEAN is uh, with their principle of non-interference has been very, very quiet. And I do engage with ASEAN um, countries. Uh, I was just in uh, Malaysia, uh, Kuala Lumpur, and I uh, engaged with the deputy prime minister and the foreign minister, of course, the deputy defense minister on the issue of um, 
the ASEAN and what uh, uh, Malaysia can do in terms of this. And I think uh, Malaysia would be in a good position to refer. Um, they are party to uh, the convention. And uh, then I think Indonesia is also in a good position to do this. But we'll have to see. And I think your engagements in Malaysia and Indonesia have been very helpful. And I think we're waiting to see some um, some fruition to our multiple efforts. Yeah. Uh, Mabra, and uh, there's one other hand. And can I get one? Okay, three. Michimi, you go first. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a question broken in two parts. Um, you said, obviously, uh, the Security Council needs an overhaul and review. Um, how realistic is that? Um, and, and how do we move forward to get that? That's the first thing. And second thing is, um, for the last two years, um, we have uh, patted on the back Bangladesh um, for allowing a million refugees to come inside, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and there is an active encouragement of Bangladesh um, for, for its uh, humanitarian efforts. Is it time now, considering this is the second time uh, uh, a forced repatriation has been pushed forward and, and Basunchar um, discussions have been pushed forward as well, um, statements made by the foreign minister yesterday um, as well, is it time for us to now actually say, hang on, calling a spade a spade, Bangladesh is actually complicit in this genocide alongside Burma? Hello. Can you please identify yourself and your yes. organization? Yes, my name is John. I'm also a Burmese. I'm an ethnic minority and a Christian. And I'm also a doctorate scholar. So I agree with all your uh, suggestion. You, it is good to... It, there's two issues in Myanmar case in my recommendation. First thing is immediate action, you know, all these things, immediate action taken from international community and uh, within domestic action. So I agree all these case violated by Myanmar government and those things. And second thing is, you know, uh, it is not easy to understand by many other countries because the concept of ethnic minority in Myanmar is not easy to understand. It's not the same with other countries. So ethnic, that is one basic problem, is structural problem in Myanmar. And like that, uh, extreme Buddhism, extreme Burmanism, they, uh, they make structural problem. So that included a lot of violation in Myanmar, you know like economic crime, you know, Myanmar is big economic crime, in my opinion. With this economic crime by military and government, there's a lot of uh, right violations happen. And so, with this structure problem and those things, if we can solve it for a long time for forwarding the country, nation building, like federalism and those all the structure, I think we can solve a lot of things, like ethnic minority, like a major ethnic group. If they have their own federalism and their own right to build, I think within their own state, you know, they can solve a lot of things. Within Rakhine State, I think Rohingya can be also the main group in Rakhine State. But now, the central government, military, or Burman, government interfering in any community state, the ending has no right to decide by their own many cases. So this is structural problem. That is my recommendation. Thank you. Michimi okay. Sensei uh, here. I'm Michimi Miranoshi. Uh, professor of Political Science and International Politics at Gakushu University in Tokyo, Japan. I, I think you said, uh, suggested the importance of admission of guilt on the side of the Burmese government. My question is, what happens 
by any chance, if it happens uh, by any chance, how could be the reaction of the Burmese people, uh, the international reaction to that? The Japanese government said that uh, the position is that because the, uh, the democracy of Myanmar is so weak, just begun, so you shouldn't push Myanmar by far by, in your words, calling spade a spade. So what is your response to the position of uh, such response like Japan's? Okay. Um, shall we let um, Professor Yangi Lee respond to these questions? Okay. Or one, one comment? Okay. Thank you for these very um, important questions and comments and recommendations. Um, how do we do an overall of the Security Council? Well, the, of course, it's the member states that will have to be on board. The UN, United Nations, uh, the Security General, uh, Ban Ki-moon and now Guterres, um, they're out to do a reform of the United Nations. But this is the, uh, the Secretariat of the United Nations, I'm sure, and it's all of its agencies. Um, but I think it's this, uh, the member states that need to bring this forward. And there have been some uh, movement within the Security Council. For instance, what is holding many issues back is the P5, the, the veto vote of the P5. And is that is that fair? I mean, in this modern age, 21st century, is it acceptable? And, I, and, and some countries have started to raise that issue of, okay, let's take a, a flat vote, not just a, a um, uh, not within, notwithstanding the P5 veto vote, to even put a Myanmar on the Security Council uh, agenda or even a, a resolution, a strong resolution. And they've kind of watered down and, and taken to a president's statement or, you know, they've really ha didn't do anything um, that was substantial, okay? As long as China and Russia are in the Security Fa Council P5 with enjoying the um, veto vote, there won't be any movement on um, the... Myanmar issues. However, we don't know. Maybe China will have a different heart and say, okay, let's see how this will take its own course. So we're hoping that to make China to understand that it would be in their best interest, and I'm not going to go into China and its own problems in its own backyard, because that's not my mandate. Maybe they might. So I think this is where all the uh, 193 members, well, 192, excluding China, states must uh, engage with China to talk about this. Okay? Now, should we hold on and say, hang on, let's call Bangladesh and see if they're complicit to this genocide? Let's not go that far yet. I wouldn't go that far yet. It's um, very frustrating that there's no movement, there's no change. And um, Sheikha Hazina had said in one of her public meetings that during the last year, there were 40,000 new births in Cox's Bazaar. So you can imagine the density of the, prob the uh, population there. But we have to understand and recognize that no country in the world has, is hosting the largest refugee camp of the 21st century. So go to my website and you'll see a link to Flickr that I took off Northern Rakhine after the 2016 um, clearance operation, and I have pictures of Bashanchar. I was the only one allowed to go to Bashanchar, and I was there last year. So have a, have a look. Thank you. Um, immediate action. I don't know if it was a, it was a question to me, but um, the structural problems, the Mabata is a, a major, major um, force in the Myanmar 
society. Uh, so I don't know how to comment on this, but you, you will see that the Tatmadaw's involvement in all the business activities throughout Myanmar, and how uh, uh, and the, how some of the military funds are also being um, channeled into Tatmadaw. I mean, into Mabada. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, admission of guilt, international reaction, and the people. And it's a new fragile democracy. Yes, that's an excuse I've been hearing too far. Yeah. It, it, but it, it did have a democracy before they win. Yeah, and let's not forget uh, that was 70 years ago, but it was 70 years ago, it was there. And during the 60, 70 years, um, they never had the first-hand experience with democracy, but um, South Korea, we haven't had democracy that long. And once, the, and I've been, I've been um, expressing this to the military, to the Tamadol when I met with them, to the, um, the Ministry of Defense, and even in Tenzin's government, and with the, um, with the Deputy Commander-in-Chief. That, <clears throat> judging from my experience, when the military laid down their arms, look what it can do to your country. Okay, right now, in my last report, the other accounts, that I have exposed, uh, that I reported on, um, uh, uh, of extractive and natural resources, where 55% of the revenue flow into the other accounts. Only 45% go into the government revenue. The 55%, we don't know where it's used, how it's used. There's no oversight, it's not transparent. That that, all that money can be used to support services that is needed in Myanmar. They have recently said, the government had recently said that all of the other counts would be banned. Okay. Myanmar is not a poor country. It is heavily resourced. Natural resources, you have gold, you have oil, you have natural gas, you have jade, which produces 90% of the world's jade, high quality jade, which, and also 100% of Chinese consumption. Amber, ruby, the best quality ruby, um, gold and silver, uranium, lithium, it's all there. But, it's not being used for its people. Okay. And what, if you channeled all of that into services for the people, it would make a night and day difference. Admission of guilt is where you start. I, yes, I have done this. And this is what we want, the Japanese government. The, the king, the pre previous king and the new king, has said that we are deeply sorry but Abe's government is not saying this. The, we have only 20 comfort women left. They've, they're all passing away. And they don't want money at this point. They want restoration of their name and dignity. Okay? And the way that can be done is for Japanese government to say, Yes, we are sorry. It's not just, just the Japan, it's not just the sexual slavery, it's also forced labor. We have many people who were shipped to Sakhalin and now they're in Eastern, uh, Central, um, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. Uh, they're, they're third generation Koreans are there as a result of shipped uh, forced labor to, um, to other places. My aunt, I have an aunt, um, who was actually in the border and the dock of being shipped as a comfort woman. She was uh, a high school student. My mother had to go and get her. My father was recruited to the Japanese army. Uh, and so we know what that 
process is like. Now, let's not, it's like the ASEAN saying, the principle of non-interference, it's all national sovereignty, but it's become a regional issue and it has all the, um, all the indicators that it will potentially explode into a global issue is that being quiet, quiet diplomacy. Let's be incremental, let's not push too far. I don't think that has worked. Quiet diplomacy in, in Myanmar has not worked. It has not worked. Look what's happened. Yeah. And, um, and I have been advocating to ASEAN countries that maybe it's time for ASEAN to adopt the principle of non-indifference. Okay, we have a point one million point five million Rohingya refugees throughout the world, mostly in ASEAN countries. There's a big population in in Indonesia, Thailand, and Indonesia, uh, but there's not only just. Um, the Rohingya population in Malaysia refugees, there's all other ethnic minority population in uh, Malaysia too. So, okay. thank you. Any other questions? Um, uh, hmm? Yeah. And we're running late. Um, yeah, we are running very late, and so we will take one uh, concise question, so I cannot ask that question. <laughs> so it has to be somebody and, else. And I'm sorry, I'm taking, my answers are very, very long. Uh, Yasmin, please. You're the last one. Yeah. Can you say who you are? Hi, my name is Yasmin. I work with the Rohingya Human Rights Network as well as the Free Rohingya Coalition. Um, this is a bit more of a history. I'm not too sure if this is, you know, something that might be re relevant today. But I thought that. History teaches us a lot of things, and, and we probably should take lessons from it. But time and time again, we see the same mistakes being made by the United Nations as a whole, as an organization. Um, we saw the failure of the League of Nations and the withdrawal from, you know, from uh, the U.S. and many other countries from its you know, purpose and its stands back in 1920s. And what it had done in order, you know, the, the failure that it had caused um, in the wars and, and the genocide, specifically for, you know, uh, the Jewish um, Europeans. Are we seeing the same trends being, you know, um, the taking place in, in terms of the United Nations as a whole? And maybe is this a time for us to actually think about the debacle of, of the entire institutions and our ways to move forward from this, not you know, being stuck in an institution or a foundation that does not actually work. Oh, that's a very poignant um, question or comment. Uh, UN's failure. Uh, I, I, I'm being very cynical. I think the United Nations as a whole has an attention span not, not longer than a bird. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, United Nations has grown humongously. It's a big, huge dinosaur. They've lost their vision. Why they're there. Um, back to the basics. Why, why, why was an agency started? What's your vision? What's your purpose? And what's your mission? That's lost. Maybe they should stream down and really buckle down and, you know, I mean, in educational departments, you say back to basics, you know, the three R's, you know. Maybe that's what they should do um, now. But however, debacle the whole system that's not working, but that's the only forum that we can bring out and, and 
discuss things and bring things to the table. Yeah, that's the pity of this. I'm afraid, as I said, um, the UN has a, an attention span not longer than a bird. And so, yes, we are going to see this happen again and again. I'm afraid um, after Myanmar burning genocide, as you called it, and Amatya Sen called it, um, if there's an, another big uh, crisis, attention will move there. And then they say, oh my God, you know, we have to do another uh, study, and it's a systemic failure. How many systemic failures do you need? I mean, why can't you fix the first systemic failure? Okay. I always tell my graduate students, they're here too, and my children when they said, do you know the similarity? Please don't quote me. I'm sure I'm on, you're being on YouTube. But <laughs> this is when I educate my own children, let's say. <laughs> Raising my own children. There are similarities and differences between a fool and a wise person. Do you know what they are? What are the similarities? Both a fool and a wise person make mistakes. The difference is a fool repeats those same mistakes, whereas a wise person learn from those mistakes and try not to make them and prevent these mistakes from happening when they see signs, okay? As Adama Dieng said, um, genocide doesn't happen with all of a sudden overnight killing and mass rape and mass killings. You know, it happens with discriminatory regulations, small incitement uh, to violence, uh, some intolerant activities, so, some insensitive words back and forth. It's a long process. And so you would see these signs happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. On, on the cheerful note of the United Nations of the fool, um, <laughs> shall we give uh, Professor Yang Hee Lee a warm round of applause? Thank you. Sir.